I'm going to talk about spaces of the neck. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll divide the neck into spaces based on the deep cervical fascia, and then we'll look at the anatomic structures and the pathology in each space in order to make a differential diagnosis when we see a lesion. So the deep cervical fascia uh, has three layers, superficial, middle, and deep. In this uh, picture, I have the superficial layer in yellow, the middle layer in magenta, and the deep layer in cyan. So first, uh, the superficial layer, also called the investing fascia. This delineates the masticator space and the parotid space. The middle layer, or visceral, visceral fascia, and delineates the pharyngeal mucosal space in the suprahyoid neck and the visceral space in the infrahyoid neck. The deep layer delineates the perivertebral space. The, the perivertebral space we can divide into two parts, a prevertebral compartment anterior to the transverse process and a paraspinal compartment posterior to the transverse process. So in the suprahyoid neck, we have the masticator space, parotid space, pharyngeal mucosal space, and perivertebral space. And then we have spaces in between uh, those, uh, uh, those that I described. We have the parapharyngeal space in here, which we'll see has both a pre-styloid and a retrostyloid component, and we'll have the retropharyngeal and danger spaces in here. In the infrahyoid neck, we have the visceral space, perivertebral space, carotid space here, retropharyngeal and danger spaces uh, here, and the posterior cervical space, which is just this kind of little thing out here. So uh, the through the entire neck, we have the carotid space, which goes through the whole neck. In the upper neck, it's called the retrostyloid parapharyngeal space. And in the lower neck, it's called the carotid space. And then the perivertebral space and retropharyngeal and dangerous spaces also go through the entire neck. Okay, so now we're going to look at some uh, uh, the spaces individually. We'll start with an example. Here we have a, a mass. We can see it uh, out here involving uh, the muscles of mastication here, also involving the mandible. So what we're dealing with is a mass in the masticator space. All right, so the masticator space has several structures. The mandible, muscles of mastication, master temporalis and pterygoid muscles, and the V3 uh, division of the fifth cranial nerve. Pathology that we see in the masticator space, infection, often related to the teeth, tumors of the mandible or muscles, primary tumors such as sarcomas, and schwannomas of the V3. Okay, so we go back and look at our original case. If we follow the mass upward, we can see it extends all the way up to the skull base and it goes up to the foramen ovale. Here it is on post contrast. We see the mass extending from the foramen ovale all the way down through the masticator space into the mandible into the canal for the inferior alveolar nerve, which is very enlarged. This is the canal of the inferior alveolar nerve on the opposite side. So what we're dealing with here is a schwannoma, the schwannoma of the V3. Next space, uh, here's the, the lesion here. I think it's easy to see that this is in the parotid gland, so we're dealing with the parotid space. Parotid space contains the parotid gland, 
facial nerve, external carotid artery and retromandibular vein, and lymph nodes. So pathology in the parotid space, infection, parotitis or parotid abscess, benign and malignant salivary gland tumors, lymph node metastases, especially from skin cancers, lymphoma, lymphopothelial cysts in patients with HIV, and first branchial cleft cyst all occur in the parotid space. Now, when we see a lesion in the parotid space, we know the facial nerve runs through the parotid space, so we always need to evaluate the facial nerve. And the, place, the best place to do that is just below the stylomastoid foramen. So this is the normal stylomastoid foramen on the right. It's sort of bell-shaped, and people sometimes call it the bell of the stylomastoid foramen. Normally, it contains fat, should be fat density. When we look at the side of the where there where we have a parotid demas, uh, we can see that here within that stylomastoid foramen instead of fat density is soft tissue density. We can follow it further along the mastoid segment of the facial nerve canal or the vertical segment. This is a normal mastoid segment on the right. On the left, the mastoid segment is destroyed here. The bone is, is eroded. It's markedly widened. And we can go further up to the tympanic segment. Again, we see the tympanic segment of the facial nerve canal is very wide compared to the, the normal right side. So here we're dealing with a tumor of the parotid gland. This one turned out to be adenoid cystic cancer, which has a very high propensity for perineural spread. Another patient with bilateral parotid space uh, lesions, uh, cystic here in both parotid spaces. Uh, this patient uh, also has uh, enlarged uh, adenoids, some enlarged lymph nodes. This is a patient with HIV, and these are lymphopathelial lesions of the parotid. The next patient, uh, we see a, a mass here on T2 weighted images and pre contrast T1 and post-contrast T1. This mass is next to the pharyngeal mucosal space. So we can describe this mass as being in the parapharyngeal space. And as I said before, the parapharyngeal space has two compartments, a pre-styloid and a retro-styloid. So this is in the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space. Normally, the only structure that's in this pre stylate parapharyngeal space is just to fat. Sometimes you have some minor salivary gland uh, tissue. So since there's not much in there, most of the time when we see a lesion in the pre stylate parapharyngeal space, it's due to spread of infection or tumor from one of the adjacent spaces, pharyngeal mucosal space, parotid space, or masticator space, and most commonly spread of disease from the parotid space. So let's go back to our lesion here in the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space. And this one, we can see it actually is in contact with the deep lobe of the parotid gland here. So this lesion is a pleomorphic, pleomorphic adenoma of the deep lobe of the parotid. Now this is just to contrast a lesion in the masticator space from a lesion in the pre styloid parapharyngeal space, the masticator space lesion displaces the parapharyngeal, space, the parapharyngeal fat, it displaces the fat both posteriorly and medially, whereas the pre styloid parapharyngeal space lesion just displaces the parapharyngeal fat 
immediately. Another patient, another mass, also looks similar to the one we just saw in that it's located in the parapharyngeal region. It's located adjacent to the mucosal, pharyngeal mucosal space, so we could call it a parapharyngeal mass. This one is in the retrostylite parapharyngeal space, which is a continuation of the carotid space. And we'll see how to differentiate those in, in just a minute. So in the carotid space, our retrostylite parapharyngeal space, we have the carotid artery, jugular vein, cranial nerves 9 through 12, and the sympathetic chain. The pathology that we'll see in the retrostylate parapharyngeal space and carotid space will include carotid aneurysms and dissections, jugular vein thrombosis, schwannomas of the 9th through 12th cranial nerves or the sympathetic chain, and paragangliomas. So let's go back to our case. This is a retrostyloid parapharyngeal mass. This one turned out to be a schwannoma. Okay, so how do we distinguish a retrostyloid parapharyngeal mass from a prestyloid parapharyngeal mass? So you might think the easiest way would be to see if it's in front or, or behind the styloid process, and that works if the lesion is very small, uh, but when the lesion is big, even if it started behind the styloid process, it's going to extend in front of it. So that, uh, in general, doesn't work. So the best way is to look for the carotid artery. So here's the cr internal carotid artery here. And in this patient, this is the internal carotid artery here. So a retrostyloid parapharyngeal space is going to displace the carotid artery anteriorly and medially, whereas a prestylate parapharyngeal space mass is just going to be in front of the carotid. It's not going to displace it. It may push it backward against the spine a little bit, but really doesn't have anywhere to go. This is lower in the neck, another carotid space mass. Again, here's the carotid sheath here is displaced. This lesion is interesting because on post-contrast MRI, it enhances with contrast, whereas on post-contrast CT, it does not seem to enhance very much. When you see a lesion with this enhancement uh, pattern, this uh, is generally going to be a schwannoma. And the reason for that is because although the schwannomas will enhance with contrast, they tend to enhance slowly. And the CT is typically done very shortly after the contrast is injected, where the MR uh, is done usually a couple of minutes after the contrast is injected. So the lesion may have time to completely enhance on MRI, but may not yet have enhanced on the CT. Another, another mass here in the retrostyloid parapharyngeal space. We know it's retrostyloid because it displaces the carotid artery here anteromedially. This is a smaller mass. And here's the internal carotid displaced anteromedially. In this patient, we did an MR angiogram. This is the MR angiogram, and we can see on the, this is a contrast enhanced MR angiogram, and we can actually see the mass right here behind the internal carotid on this contrast enhanced MR angiogram. So this uh, lesion represents a paraganglioma. This is a glomus vagali paraganglioma. The paragangliomas are named just by where they're located. So if it's in the jugular foramen, then it's a glomus jugulari. If it's just below the skull base, it's a glomus vagali. And if it's at the carotid bifurcation, 
then it would be a carotid body tumor. So the way we distinguish a schwannoma from a paraganglioma is that the paraganglioma is a hypervascular tumor. So if we do a contrast-enhanced MR angiogram or CT angiogram or a conventional angiogram, the paraganglioma will enhance during the arterial phase of the study, whereas the schwannoma enhances slower, so it will not enhance during the arterial phase. Another patient, here's a mass. This one is between the internal carotid, external carotid here, jugular vein here, and this is the MR angiogram. This is uh, the right side, the normal side. We see the carotid bifurcation, and on the left side, we see the enhancing tumor right in the crotch of that carotid bifurcation. So this is another paraganglioma. This one is a carotid body paraganglioma. We have another patient. This patient has a mass here. And this uh, mass is medial to the parapharyngeal fat. Here's the parapharyngeal fat here. So this mass is going to be in the pharyngeal mucosal space. So in the pharyngeal mucosal space, we have mucosa, lymphoid tissue of Wilder's ring, and minor salivary gland tissue. So the pathology we have in the pharyngeal mucosal space, we can get squamous cell cancer, infection, tonsillitis or abscess, lymphoma, minor salivary gland tumors, retention cysts, and torn walled cyst. So here's our patient on the post-contrast images uh, over here. This is post-contrast with fat suppression. There is no enhancement with contrast. So this represents a retention cyst. You can get a retention cyst in any mucosal space, and the key is it's fluid signal and does not enhance with contrast. Now, just to contrast uh, the lesion in the masticator space from the pharyngeal mucosal space, remember the masticator space lesion will displace the parapharyngeal fat inferiorly, it's not inferiorly, excuse me, posteriorly and medially here, posterior and medial, whereas the pharyngeal mucosal space lesion will displace the parapharyngeal fat laterally here. This uh, is a midline lesion in the nasopharynx, very characteristic for a torn walled cyst. This patient has a mass in the tonsillar region and enlarged lymph nodes. This is typical in a patient with squamous cell cancer of the tonsil. So another patient with a mass in the tonsil here. Again, it's in the pharyngeal mucosal space. Here's the parapharyngeal fat lateral to it. This patient came in with sore throat and fever, and this is a patient with a tonsillitis and a peritonsillar abscess. If you look carefully at the parapharyngeal fat in this patient with the tonsillitis, you can see on the right side the fat is a little bit higher density, a little dirty fat compared to the, the normal parapharyngeal fat on the left side. Uh, this is uh, similar uh, with a, a lesion uh, in the uh, tonsil here. Uh, this one, the parapharyngeal uh, fat is uh, normal. There's no enhancement. This patient was asymptomatic, and this is just a retention cyst of the tonsil. Next space, here's the the mass, it's in front of the spine here. So here we're dealing with a lesion in the perivertebral space. So what's normally in this space? The prevertebral, scalene, and paraspinal muscles, the vertebrae, vertebral artery, and the brachial plexus. Pathology, infection, osteomyelitis, and abscess. Metastasis, 
to the spine, as well as primary vertebral tumors and nerve sheath tumors. So in this particular patient, when we look at the MRI, uh, we see enhancements surrounding the odontoid process. This is a patient with the fever. And this is uh, infection in the perivertebral space. This patient has an, another patient who has a low-density lesion in front of the spine here. Here it is. Also in front of the spine. In fact, it goes pretty much up to the spine in the midline. So are we dealing with another lesion in the perivertebral space? No. Uh, this is the retropharyngeal and danger space. Uh, and uh, although pathologically the retropharyngeal and danger spaces uh, are slightly different for uh, imaging standpoint. Uh, we're going to just talk about them as a single space because imaging wise they cannot be separated. So what's in the space normally? Just some fatty areolar tissue and the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So the pathology, we can get non-abscess fluid and of course an abscess. We can get nodal metastases, uh, most commonly from nasopharyngeal or thyroid cancer, and we can get lymphoma. So here's our patient again with this low density retropharyngeal lesion. Notice in this case, it has a relatively flat contour, no enhancement around it. This is non-abscess fluid. Another patient with a retropharyngeal lesion, here it is uh, here in this case, it's a little more rounded. We can see some gas in it. It extends into the mediastinum. This is a retropharyngeal abscess. Remember the retropharyngeal space extends into the mediastinum. So if we have infection there, we need to look to make sure there's not infection extending into the mediastinum. And the way we usually would distinguish abscess from non-abscess fluid is the abscess tends to have rounded margins. The non-abscess fluid tends to be relatively flat uh, the abscess uh, often has uh, enhancement around it, although this is not uh, a consistent finding. And uh, sometimes we can't tell them apart, so we can't always be uh, completely confident on that. So we need to be able to distinguish a retropharyngeal space lesion from a perivertebral space lesion, and both of them can go up to the spine. So what's, uh, what's the difference? So the way we distinguish them is a retropharyngeal space lesion the prevertebral muscles, the longus coli muscles here, are going to be normal. Whereas in the perivertebral space lesion, it's going to involve the longus coli muscles. So that's the way we distinguish retropharyngeal space from perivertebral space. This lesion here is a retropharyngeal lymph node. And we know it's a retropharyngeal lymph node because it's between the longus coli muscle here and the internal carotid artery here. So we'll look at some more of this. So this is a retropharyngeal lymph node. This is another patient with a retropharyngeal lymph node here. And again, it's between the longus coli muscle and the internal carotid artery. In this patient, uh, the lymph node is due to this nasopharyngeal cancer right over here. All right, so we need to be able to distinguish a retropharyngeal lymph node from a retrostyloid parapharyngeal mass. So the way we do it, remember the retropharyngeal lymph node is between the longus coli muscle and the internal carotid artery. So the internal carotid artery is lateral to the retropharyngeal lymph node, whereas in this patient with a retrostyloid parapharyngeal mass, the internal carotid is medial to it. So internal carotid here, longus coli muscle here. So that's how we distinguish the retropharyngeal lymph node from the retrostyloid parapharyngeal mass. Here we have a large mass involving the larynx. This is in the visceral space. 
The visceral space contains the larynx and trachea, hypopharynx and cervical esophagus, thyroid and parathyroid glands, and the recurrent lindrial nerves, as well as lymph nodes. So the lesions we'll see in that space, laryngeal cancer, hypopharyngeal or esophageal cancer, goiters and thyroid cancers, parathyroid adenomas, lymph node metastases and lymphoma, and infrahyoid thyroglossal duct cysts. So this uh, particular patient with this large laryngeal mass, we're dealing with a squamous cell cancer of the larynx. Another patient with a mass here involving the thyroid, so a patient with thyroid cancer. You can also see a abnormal lymph node over here. And this is a patient with a esophageal cancer here. In this patient, we have a cystic lesion in the visceral space. And if we uh, look carefully, we can see that the lesion comes up to the midline over here at the hyoid bone. It's a cystic lesion. It's embedded in the strap muscles. Here's the strap muscles embedded in these muscles. This represents a thyroglossal duct cyst, infrahyoid thyroglossal duct cyst. We typically think about a thyroglossal duct cyst as a midline lesion, but the ones below the hyoid bone tend to come to one side or another. Uh, the thyroid cartilage has this pointy configuration, so it, it's very difficult for something to stay in the midline here. So usually they slide off to one side or the other, and this is a typical infrahyoid thyroglossal duct cyst. Finally, the posterior cervical space, uh, not much uh, in there. Fat cranial nerve 11 and lymph nodes. Most of the lesions we see in this posterior cervical space are just inflammatory or neoplastic lymph nodes, very rarely a schwannoma. Okay, so now let's just review. Uh, we'll review this, look at the spaces in the upper neck and the spaces in the lower neck. We learned how to distinguish a lesion in the pharyngeal mucosal space, which is going to displace the parapharyngeal fat laterally here. Masticator space, which is going to displace the parapharyngeal fat medially and posteriorly. And a Pre-styloid parapharyngeal uh, space mass, which is going to displace the parapharyngeal fat medially. We learned how to distinguish a retrostyloid parapharyngeal space mass, which is going to displace the carotid anteromedially, from a pre-styloid parapharyngeal space mass, which is not going to displace the, rot the carotid, it's just going to push it posteriorly against the spine. We learned how to distinguish a paraganglioma from a schwannoma in the carotid space. A paraganglioma is a hypervascular lesion, so it will enhance during the arterial phase of an MR angiogram or a CT angiogram or a conventional angiogram, whereas a schwannoma enhances more slowly, so it will not enhance during the arterial phase. We learned how to distinguish a retropharyngeal lymph node which is between the longus coli muscle and internal carotid artery from a retrostyloid parapharyngeal mass, which displaces the internal carotid artery anteromedially. And we learn how to distinguish a lesion in the retropharyngeal space, in which case the longus coli muscles are normal from a lesion in the perivertebral space, which is going to involve the longus coli muscles. When we see a lesion in the masticator space, we always need to evaluate V3. And when we see a lesion 
in the product space, we always need to evaluate the facial nerve. I hope this has been helpful. Thanks for watching.